Philip Levine is uh, one of my heroes. Um, he manages to live um, a full and creative life in what seems to be nearly a wilderness, a wilderness nearly equal to that of Hamilton, um, somewhere in, near uh, Woodstock or Bearsville or uh, somewhere in the woods east of here. And he, um, he does lots of, of things of which I know only a little bit. Uh, I know, for instance, that he um, showed up in the wee hours last Monday morning uh, because he had been moon in Tom Stoppard's The Real Inspector Hound uh, up until midnight or so. And I know that he does enormous amount of performance, poetry, acting, what have you. Um, I don't know if he has any uh, honest occupation, but I know he has these <laughs> wonderful gifts and skills, uh, one of which he'll share with us tonight. Um, He's a two-year alumnus of the Writers' Conference. We're very grateful for that. He calls himself an approximate poet. You can ask him what that means. He competed in the 2000 National Poetry Slam. He hosts a weekly open mic in Woodstock, New York. Philip recently performed on the stage as Austin in Sam Shepard's True West. So he doesn't just focus on Stoppard, I see, uh, and is currently working on his first book of poetry, on a poetry game, and on a one-person show tentatively titled, Five Years Equals 90 Minutes. <laughs> Philip believes that our most desperate endeavors, our most desperate endeavor is to put meaning into our lives. We all concur, <laughs> and he does that by writing, chasing those iridescent moments of what Martha Graham called queer, divine, dissatisfaction. Philip Levine. Thank you very much, Matt. It's quite an honor to be here and a, and a pleasure. And, it, and maybe even more than that, it's, it's kind of like mythic return, because it was uh, two years ago in this room that I read in public for the first time. And uh, I think it's all about giving ourselves permission, and, and it was a big part of giving myself permission to, to write, permission to read in public, and uh, I'm encouraged by seeing all, all of you doing that, and I encourage you to continue. Uh, I'm an applications programmer, is what I do for oh, real. And I live in a yurt. That's another a little tidbit. But everyone would stop. Oh, I live on a road. I live on a road that's like yurt row. It's, it's about six. There's like seven yurts on my road. It's very funny. Uh, the first piece uh, is I. I it, there's a bit of a conceit in the first piece. It's called tonight's feature, and it's no. In no way disparaging to Leela Phillips, and I and all of you, I'm sure, are looking forward to hearing you read, but it refers to the singular tonight's feature, so it's referring to myself. <laughs> tonight's feature is anxious and nervous. He is not nearly as capable as he appears. His mouth is dry, and he hasn't any gum. Tonight's feature's right shoe is tied too tightly. His hands are clammy, and he doesn't know where to put them. Tonight's feature wonders why he agreed to do this. <laughs> he wishes rather that it was snowing big flaked and heavy and he was outside playing in it. Tonight's feature is broken in many places and has a pain in his chest that can't be swallowed, but he feels alive when he describes it and so it will go on. Tonight's feature has been published in some places and not in many others. He has read, al <laughs> he has read aloud many times to family and friends, to himself alone, and he has read to strangers in strange places. He believes he can do this. Tonight's feature writes and writes and hopes to write again. Tonight's feature feels it gives his life meaning. He feels putting meaning into one's life is the first step to survival. Tonight's feature is practicing the impossible art of survival. Tonight's feature awoke today like any other, but knows it is not like any other, for tonight he will come some, cut something loose and clean, break open a rib and count splinters, shave something close to the bone, place it on the table, and predict the past with uncanny accuracy. And he hopes to howl. 
and he will stammer, stutter, and shout. He will not shut up. He will not be quiet. He will not stop until I make him. And I think this piece is the, the piece that I read two years ago. Uh, it's called Thread. Here, take it. Caress it. Run it through your fingers. Taste its color. Smell how smooth. If you finally wish, thread it through your single eye and hand me back the end. This back and forth will weave a world. We could do this. This mystic stitch, this slender line that runs from me to you. I live along its length. Uh, this next piece has uh, become a bit of a signature piece. And it, it kind of happened here that I, I, I had like the body of it. And then I was in Tom Slay, who I miss, and I hope he's doing well. I haven't talked to him in a while. But Tom Slay gave us an assignment to play around with long and short lines. And so I took something that I had and I kind of massaged it a bit and I came up with uh, this uh, stream of anxiety piece <laughs> called, uh, <laughs> called Rant 64. In a minute on the subway. So you're sitting and you're staring and something just smacks you in your head. You turn around and it smacks you in your other head. And you're not hurt, but something's running out your ear and running down your neck. And it kind of tickles, but not funny tickles. So you're not laughing, but you're not crying either. In fact, you're not doing anything either way. But you don't care because a woman. And all the people you've never met seem to know you because they keep phoning. And though they never say anything, you know that they don't know you because they always mispronounce your name. And when they tell you that there's no annual fee, you know that they're lying. It'll still take a lifetime to pay. It'll still take a lifetime to pay. And besides you. It'll still take a lifetime to pay. Yeah, you'll maybe. And what are you going to do with all this aluminum siding anyway, living in an apartment with no windows and only walls, only inside walls? So you tell them that you've died and hence you won't be needing siding. <laughs> but if they leave their number, you'll call them back if you snap out of it. They won't and you don't. Besides, you know, aluminum siding is quite different than a silver lining. And instead, you've got clouds. Clouds that are so heavy, they aren't lined with aluminum or silver or anything except probably lead. So it makes sense that they're so heavy and that your arms are so tired and your back is so tired and your head is so tired. And you're just so tired just from carrying them around all the time. But right now you just don't care because a woman on the subway. And your feet hurt because they do or maybe because your shoes don't fit anymore, at least the way you've been wearing them. So you swear tomorrow you'll try them on your other feet and yet you know you won't. Who cares about shoes anyway because it's pants that count. And you should know because you're wearing them, at least in this family and in that family, and in fact in every family that you've ever known, because that's what you've always remembered wearing, and always remembered other people not wearing. And besides, you know, like you've never known anything else, but every family has to have someone who wears the pants, and you're just it. And yet you wonder if you'll ever get the chance to take them off and just run naked, and almost without worry. And you remember once, you almost did, you almost jumped into a river, or was it a lake, or maybe it was the ocean. But then you remember you just don't know, because you just didn't jump. But you decide then and there you don't care. Because a woman on the subway moving towards you. And then it's dark, and you've never seen it this black before, and you can't even see your own fingers. You jam it in your nose to see if you can feel even what it is when it's black, and you think you feel, but you can't be sure because you don't really know, really. You just think you know. And you just get by with that because that is all you ever, ever have to get by with anyway. And you let it go at that. In fact, you let everything go, including all the things you ever dreamed of, and all the things you ever wanted, and clutch instead of the few things you've got, like your nose and your finger. And sometimes, once, maybe, just maybe, the sight and smell and touch a possibility of a woman on the subway moving towards you, now moving away. <laughs> I was thinking of something Justin said about uh, the story that we read, the reunion piece, and that was something neat about it. It took about five minutes to read, and it happened over a course of an hour and a, about an hour and a half or so, so we had a 10 to 1. Well, that takes about three minutes to read, and it happens over one minute, so I got him beat. <laughs> one to three. Minutes. So I'm going to change gears a little bit. Uh, this is a a somewhat newer piece. It's called The Boy Finds the Small Things. The boy finds the small things and puts them in the right place. 
Here he places a pear, here a ripe rose. In his shoe he finds a pebble, he returns it to the wood. He retrieves the discarded penny, from the date he knows its nature. Before 82, our holy cop, before 82, holy copper, after sandwich tin. He feels in his small way he is helping. The boy finds the paper clip, curious. Should it be placed alone, or is it meant to hold a place for something else? A photo, an old note, a few words. In his room, he removes everything from his bag. One by one, his bag is emptied. He is ready to see the world. He hears that in town, there is a lost and found. He will go. Returning, his bag again full, he clears an area. He pauses over every object, considers, and pauses again. These things take time. A climbing carefully, or falling without fear. The single mitten, the only sock. This is uh, carpentry and gardening. I have broken hearts through the careless use of lilac and hammer. Pounded salt like nails into the thinnest wounds and split the wood. I have twisted the root back upon itself to knot and choke. Left the splinters of fine things in my fingers to pus and swell. Breathe the dust of the dowel cut and rabbit run. I have let the sawtooth rust in the rain. Buried flowers, buried flower beds in yards of mud, and for many seasons seen only the crack of grass between the rock. I have built crooked stairs that climb to empty places, hung doors where windows go, and placed clear glass in entry paths. I have cut the stem before the bloom and scent. I have ripped the headboard ragged. Still, I have both hands and all my fingers, and I can still feel the raised grain of moistened wood, and smell the wild queen's lace, and see the tulips glow. And now I have made this plain and simple flower box of clean straight edge, rich in soil, and well drained with stone. The plot is ready for seed, sun, and water. piece called Heels. It's kind of, it's a memory, a lot of memory pieces. And this is sort of, it's, it's more than the indulgence of memory, it's the indulgence of remembering, I think, that we do when we write these memory pieces. Uh, heels as in, of a shoe. My hard black heels healed nothing. I plunged ahead like timber falling. I could not stop myself seeing salad days. Risking our toes to sheep's meadow green, we laughed wide open, fat mouths and tongues ripe for spices from the Orient, for Chinatown, mustard seed, pig's feet, and upside down ducks, blank eyes dreaming out, us looking up. And I would go back there in the uniform of the contrite, but before I kissed you again goodbye forever, I'd shine those shoes. Full moon Saturday. It's Saturday night, and the moon has her high beams on. And up on the mountain, it's rutting season. And all the young dudes have their boots on high. But I have no howl left, and I can no longer see in that kind of light. And the night is so close, it's hot in your nose, and everyone stops to contemplate their next move. But it's the moon's move, and with her one wide eye, she presses hard on everyone's pedal. For a moment, I feel alive again. Thank you, Mark. Uh, the Stranger. The Stranger. Stop me if you know this one. The stranger often puts his arms around you, but always from behind, 
The stranger smiles like he's known you forever. The stranger says he has a war wound, but he won't say what. The stranger doesn't eat fish, but he won't say why. The stranger sometimes looks at you as if he sees straight through. The stranger is always alone, except when he's alone with you. The stranger seems to be deaf in his left ear, but denies it when you ask him. The stranger says he's from a town you've never heard of. It sounds like Eastern Europe, but then you think perhaps Ohio. <laughs> the stranger always has a cigarette, but you have never seen him smoke. The stranger routinely asks to stay the night, rarely seems to sleep, and is never there when you awake. The stranger never calls when you're at home, but has left you exactly one message every week you've known him. For now, you think, the stranger makes you happy like no one else ever has. Ooh, ow, ooh. <laughs> You know that guy, right? <laughs> or girl. Thanks. This is another old one. Thank you for the magnetic poetry set. <laughs> there are now words all over my refrigerator. And on the floor all around. Words are hiding in the grass and falling with the, with the rain. I'm finding words tangled with the hair in my hairbrush and streaming down from the sun. I now have words for everything. Words like inchoate and gloaming. <laughs> Salubrious, peritonitis, loquacious, beryllium. Modal, aloof, lope, I am, smear, quill, and garnish. Words are hiding in the toes of my shoes and under my car seat. I am finding words everywhere. Words are coming out of my ears, leaking out of my belly. There are words all over my fucking dictionary. <laughs> this is one that's conspicuously missing urine. <laughs> you know, we've talked about lilies and urine. No urine. I don't think. I mean, maybe. <laughs> maybe between the lines. <laughs> Invitation to a nap. Peas pop on this thing. Invitation to a nap. Sleeping, like breathing, is a relief to forget and remember over and over. When we kiss, I remember the sound of water pour over stone and forget how simply glass can slice to bone. Come to me like feather down and spill on me like fingers. Place one hand on my belly and your other wherever you wish and I will show you laughter so silent my mouth drifts open. Okay, I've told you. Now, let's remember sleep and forget to breathe. Find a field where the green drips beautiful like yellow. Watch lazy clouds swallow the day's impossible blue. Shift the weight of sleep to give a little more room to move a little closer. A couple more, and then we'll play with cards. So this is, uh, who is language? This is another one of those sort of, uh, when, you, when you, your mind is racing so fast that the whole, the whole job is to get out of the way, stay out of the way, and just try to slow it down just enough so you can keep your hand keeping up with it. And that's how this one fell out. Who is language? Who is language that stumbles in with stutter and lisp, yet pronounces all its P's? Who is language that chips thin blue ice from thick red air and tosses pitch after wild pitch? Who spins tails like tops and carries us to grandma's house or the darker side of moons? Who unpedals the rose yet still leaves it smelling sweet, whether naming or unnaming it? Paints castles in the air and invites us in for tea and smoke, then opens dungeon doors and says, go out, go on, go down, go see. Who is language, and is he, she, and doesn't matter when change is just an or away, that gives and takes this or that, then puts it in his hat and says, hello, how are you, I am fine, and are you hungry, have some more of me, and drink, and drink, and drink some more, it's here, it's good, it's free gives fever, pitch, and measure, and tosses earth and cloud together, and then by magic brings a storm that rages in between. 
Who is this that twists his tongue to shapes we've never seen, that burrows to our core of hearts and takes us to the stars and counts most every one, who climbs atop the heads of pins and knows every angel's name, who takes time as line and gives us rhyme, who hands us rubies and tells us what they're worth and what they're not, who takes our masterpiece and hangs it on the wall face back and says there's more to do to tell to paint and tells us paint again. Shall we call him friend, this churlish Merlin, this palmer of cards, this beast that creeps about our legs and lifts our hearts, our arms, then singes the hair about our eyes and brings those eyes to burning, who bubbles blood and crackles skin, and then can also chill the bone to still and freeze the tongue as on a winter lamppost. He is the stuff of knowing and the silence knowing brings. He is the sanest madness and is never viewed but baffles as the earth corrupting, spilling red ore of mantle broken. So shall we follow him, he that bites us on the ass, even as we hang on to tails, who spits fire and perfectly round oranges and webs of delight and desire, and then dissolves to thoughts, perhaps I might be dreaming where chance is the stuff of certainty, or exactly that reversed, where might and what might be is, and all that is twist once like shifting blinds until maybe is not so. Like smile creeping or frown of glee, language boxes surprise like presents, bow and glitter and shiny promise, but inside only air. But something grows in the space of in the, in the space of telling, and that is green and live and breathe, and that is us or our or our knowing of us, and that's who language is or what he does. The share of this, of breaking mirrors, and in the scattered shards, the portrait of our becoming. Who is language? One may never know, but if it could be told, it doesn't matter. The telling is the story. So speak or chant or whisper. Uh, so speak or chant or sing or whisper if you wish. Open up and out and out aloud. The words are hers and his and yours and ours. And by so doing, we become the gods around the fire. Questions for a blind date. <laughs> have you ever broken your tie? Have you ever broken your neck with a tie? Does water melt in your mouth? Do you reach for the thorn or the petal? Do you twitch on purpose? <laughs> Is the subway a place you like to go? Do you need to think about breathing? Do you believe the ground? Are your hands willing? Are your fingers able? Do you trust your shadow? Do you let her hold your keys? May I see you again? May I ask you other questions? Do you always walk in the direction you're going? Do you dream of dreaming? Can you bleed whatever you need, whenever you must? Do you confuse flying with falling? Can you bend in all directions? Do you walk through mirrors? Would you take me with you? When you hold a child's hand, do you pull into the future, or are you pulled into the past? What color are your secrets? Is your whisper wet? May I see you again? May I show you all my questions? That's it for the prepared portion of the program. <laughs> so right at the home. <laughs> so uh, during dinner, my able assistants. Megan Heflin and David Thorine asked you to pick cards. And these cards kind of grew out of my inability to finish poems. And uh, so, you know, we all do this. You know, you get ideas for poems, little nice licks or something, or maybe not. And, you say, and so I just started saving them. And finally, I just got fed up with that, that, list, that batch becoming longer than anything I had. So, I <laughs> so what I started to do was I would pick a bunch of them sort of create an order and then, you know, read them as a piece. So like 30 or so would be like three minutes or, or so. And then I got the, well, a friend of mine suggested that I was kind of undoing their nature of being sort of these standalone things, that, that by making it random, it kind of was more to their nature. So I put them on cards and then I would do different things and, and, and that's how Epicast, Orphans, and Oops were born. <laughs> and that's in either poems that died or were born unparented or are accidents of some other nature. 
And so I have, I guess about, there's probably about 60 here, which is too many. So I'll take half. So if you're, if you're, if the one you selected didn't get read, too bad. <laughs> Sorry, I should say. So uh, and maybe I'll shuffle the ones that, just for, just to honor John Cage and Russell McLeod, McLeod? Jackson McLeod, who I'm not familiar with, but Robin Bain tells me I should be, and I will be. Uh, so uh, here we go. Tomorrow never comes, perhaps the day after. I won't stop till I'm done. That was then. This is chocolate. <laughs> Fall. Who will bury all these leaves? Waiting with Godot, the sequel. <laughs> Reincarnation. Here today and back tomorrow. <laughs> Abandoned by careless angels. To boldly split infinitives. <laughs> that always goes well with the writing crowd. <laughs> and also the trekkies, I guess. If I had a nickel for every nickel I've had, I'd be even. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm either up or down. If this is lightning and this is thunder, how far away am I? <laughs> Thank you, Bill. I should never have fastened my balloon to your belt loop. This is a love poem in every state except in Louisiana. <laughs> a poem in four dementia. You asked if I might be falling. I asked if you might fall too. And some kind of goes. Sometimes we fall together. Sometimes we fall apart. Your car must be this tall to ride this road. <laughs> Hanging on to nothing with everything I've got. This is fictional writing. <laughs> Alienation as a point of departure. This came up yesterday. English is my second language. English is my only language. <laughs> We are all alone together. That look you gave me, how much does it cost? <laughs> we wouldn't write if we weren't consumed and driven by the total and utter fear that we had nothing, absolutely and completely nothing to say. <laughs> all my friends have heard these before. So many words. A little meter. In every poem, in, in a poem, every word counts, except, of course, the ones that don't and were omitted. When. It's not when I'm interested in, it's the instant immediately after, after it passes through the fan. <laughs> I remember deep belly laughter running down a long, narrow high hallway. There's a history of mental illness in my family, probably a future too. <laughs> I knew she was psychic from the moment she told me. <laughs> when she said, speak to me in rhyme, not riddle, I knew I didn't have a prayer or a fiddle. Uh, Terror comes like a lover, skinless and wet and wanting to touch. Have you seen the Good News Bible? 
He doesn't die in the end. <laughs> I fall from high above and climb all day to fall again. Open up, open up, I'm out here banging my head on the pavement. <laughs> You've done that, eh? My smile is wide and part of yours. I'm so distracted, I can't even focus on my obsessions. <laughs> I've heard it said that you lose 90% of your heat through your head and hands. Does that mean if you walk around on a cold day with a warm hat and good gloves, you'll be fine even if you're otherwise butt naked? <laughs> she had hair waving high. She is denying her bathing suit. Civilization is at our gate. I'm so glad this one came up, because you were talking about memory and movie, Karen was talking about memory, and I didn't say it at the time, but if I didn't have flashbacks, I'd have no memory at all. <laughs> Somewhere there's a place for us, but I don't know where it is. Thank you, Matt. Thank you all.